Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom knife maker and knife designer, Dirk Pinkerton. You hear me talk a lot about Dirk and his knives on the Midweek Supplemental and Thursday Night Knives because his designs are inspired by knives from across history and cultures, and you know that really appeals to me. His folder designs are produced by some of the finest manufacturers in the world, and his custom fixed blade knives are incredibly interesting, functional, and masterfully made. I'm honored he sends me prototypes to check out, and we have a couple of them here tonight. We'll talk all about them and a whole lot more, but first be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app, uh, podcast application. Uh, and if you'd like to help support the show, you can do so by logging on to Patreon, uh, by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon and checking out our three tiers of support. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. Dirk, it's so good to see you. Welcome back to the Knife Junkie Podcast, sir. It's good to be back. Thanks for having me back on. My pleasure. Uh, we missed you this year at Blade Show, but we got a chance to see your two new knives from Artisan Cutlery. I'm just going to come right out and say congratulations on the release of these two uh, Meisterstuchen in German, Meister uh, masterpieces, especially for me, the Kami. I love the Kami. Uh, this is the Kami and the Banjara, two very, very ethnically and culturally uh, inspired knives. Congratulations on their release, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I was uh, very, very excited when the Artisan asked to see some new designs, and then I was very excited when they said, Let's bring the Kami on. And then even more excited when they said, hey, what about that one? And yeah, I mean, they, they followed on each other really fast. So I was I was tickled pink. And I think they did an, a really excellent job in executing the uh, the design. Uh, let's I want to talk about the Kami for a minute. Uh, this, as you can see from the pork stains in the micarta, this one gets a whole lot of use, a whole lot of carry. It's got kind of everything I love in it. It's got micarta, it's got titanium, it's a frame lock, but way more than that, it's got this incredible recurve blade. It's got a flipper, a thumb plate, which is a thumb disc, which is something you're very um, uh, fond of using. And it's got this beautiful bracketing handle here. So it's great in reverse grip, forward grip, uh, I know you're always thinking about EDC, but you're also always thinking about self-defense. Tell us about where the Kami came from. And that's not C-O-M-M-I-E, by the way. <laughs> Correct. Yes, uh, it's Kami, K-A-M-I, uh, the uh, the bladesmiths that make the actual um, kukris in Nepal. Um, and you can thank um, uh, Artisan for that. They're, they're the ones that actually uh, it reminded me in discussions what uh, who those were as a, as an alternate name, my initial name for the uh, the knife was the uh, street Gurkha, um, <laughs> but they didn't think that would sell too well. So and I kind of agreed, uh, and uh, we came up with a Kami, and uh, that one stuck. I, I think that really fits. But um, it, it, I actually have always wanted to try and do a folding kukri. And I could never, ever get proportions right. It just never clicked with me when I saw what I did. It's just, it's not right. It, it's, it's just hideous, basically. Um, and then I saw uh, Jason Knight's uh, folders. And mm -hmm. I was like, okay, now, now that got me thinking. That's how you do it. Um, and uh, it made me rethink some of my designs that I had already had. And made some adjustments to uh, to get the flow right, and not wanting to, uh, I didn't want to copy him, but I definitely have to say he definitely set me straight on how to get the, everything to do what I wanted it to do. Um, so yeah, that was that was the inspiration that really brought it all together. Uh, that uh, Jason Knight MK Ultra, yeah, originally released by Elements and produced by Fox. That's uh that is also a favorite folder of mine and it looks um 
it's it's that and the cold steel uh, raja uh which to me are before this came out before the kami came out the two my two favorite folding kukris but the reason for that is that they seem to be very kukri like in yes. in in all design cues yes. with yours you've got some design cues but like with most pinkerton knives from my perspective uh it's not just settling on one knife there's there's more going on here than just the uh the kukri um and to me personally and that can be seen even in the blade shape of course we have the downward swept deeply recurved blade which is very kukri-esque but a very uh straight top edge and uh the thumb plate and then the handle is a little a little more western to me with that yes. thumb thumb thing here so i i appreciate the deviation how did that play out uh that actually also came from really taking a look at the uh, jason's um folder and <laughs> thinking through i i originally wanted to really try and nail a kukri handle as a folder and the more I played with it, the less practical it seemed from my design language. I just couldn't get it to fit how I envisioned a knife handle to function and work as a folder. Um, so I, I looked at what he did and thought of, thought it through from that perspective, and and thought instead of let's instead of approaching it as a, a kukri folder, let's do what I've done many times before and use it as an inspiration. And let's make it something that is kind of a, a blend. Um, so you have the uh, the bird beak pommel, uh, which comes from a multitude of cultures um, that helps lock the hand in. Uh, then you have the the flipper, which gives you the forward guard. Again, mm. a multitude of cultures that have you know, the single guard. Uh, and then I just married it with the the kukri blade. And I was going to go with a curved blade, but when I actually saw that put a straight edge on there and I, uh, that straight line on the spine. I was like, Nope, that's it. That, that clicked with me. Um, I like that. So this is the uh, thoroughly unscientific. I mean, my, my only stabbing medium has been cardboard thus far with this. I've been using this for everything, including, um, uh, dinner. When I go out to dinner with my wife and family, this has been a favorite. Uh, but that straight edge on, or the straight spine on the top, I think, well, it drops down to a center line point. So you kind of always know where the center is, no matter how the knife is indexed. But I feel like this swedge free straight spine really forces, forces the issue with the cut. When you're putting it in there, uh, you're not, th there's very little give on the tops, which on the top of the spine, which really pushes that deep belly uh, far into whatever you're cutting. Do you, do you know what I'm getting at? Like That's exactly, uh, what you mean. yeah. You're you're basically it, it's kind of a wedge. Um, so as you as you drive it in, that the top of the spine being broad forces the edge, the sharpened edge, down into the media and increases the cutting uh, capacity. So you're getting a little assistance through physics and geometry. Yeah, uh, like yes, very 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 wicked. Uh, blade but also i mean for edc and everything just this is such a good knife just for your average everyday cutting cutting chores it's got a nearly full height flat grind um this one is s35 vn and then there's another model with s90 v and a full titanium uh yeah. body and i'm sure that's super awesome but i'm attached to this <laughs> i'm attached to the mic i love the micarta i like the micarta myself better um just because of what my card tends to bring to handles the warmth the, the character and it allows it to patina in a particular manner whereas with uh, titanium handles you get the snail trails and the scratches the dings um, which has its own character but i think my carta just has that uniqueness to it when it does it because it's how it reacts to your hand what you get on it the the oils the acids the you know the day-to-day -day life uh, and that's different for everybody where you, you scratch up titanium, you scratch up titanium. So uh, um, a, a very famous uh, uh, knife reviewer, advanced knife bro calls that uh, patina effect on micarta, your personal filth signature, which I think is hilarious. 
<laughs> yeah, I love that. That's absolutely true. That is exactly what it is. And uh, you definitely know where you've been when you look at it. You know, it tells a story. Um, so, okay. So this is the, this is the Kami. Also, before I, I move on, cause I want to show off the Banjara too. Um, uh, the Banjara as well. It's not the Banjara too. Uh, the sculpted clip on this, uh, beautiful. And, uh, wait, there's something else I was going to bring. Well, I have forgotten in my, uh, we were talking about being a man of advanced age. I spaced what I was about to say there, but summing up, oh, I, I was going to talk about the clip, a really nice sculpted clip. I don't always go in for the sculpted clips, uh, but I really like that one. You also came uh, up out this year, you and Artisan, with the Banjara. And this one was on signs all over Blade Show, these giant signs for Artisan. I think they were big sponsors of the show. That they, but these this this was all over the place. And uh, and then when I got back, you sent me one. You sent me this one. I was like, oh, my God, that's the night. Because I don't think these were available at the time. I know they were. Uh, you could check them out. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't I'm not sure if you could buy them. The Bonjara. So you have two big releases from Artisan this year. Tell us about this one. What's the um, inspiration? So, yeah, that's definitely the uh, the Persian style upswept blade. It falls into the nomad family. Um, so it started out as basically um, a shortened version of the Nomad, the original Kaiser Nomad, and I wish I had one with me to show you, but um, they're very hard to come by nowadays, and I sold off most of mine. So, um, <laughs> But basically what it started out as was a shorter version of the Nomad, so that handle profile as you look at it, if you add just a little bit of length to it, and it's, it's actually not quite the right way to, to approach it because you would have to shrink it down to its original drawing size, which it lost uh, about an inch, I think, inch and a, inch and a quarter maybe overall on the handle, uh, a little shorter, a little more narrow. Mm -hmm. And that was what I was doing with the Nomad, trying to shrink it down, give it a more of a pocket-friendly miniature version of the Nomad and bring it down to just under a three-inch uh, blade right in that category. Um, but what happened is as I was drawing it, a translation on my CAD program upsized it a little bit somehow. So they got a slightly bigger version, which was oh. what was made. And, uh, yeah, when I saw the, the renderings, I didn't, they didn't have any measurements on it. It was just the rendering. So I'm like, yep, that looks good. Let's go with it. They prototyped it and they sent it to me. And when I opened it up, I was like, oh, <laughs> This isn't what I was thinking, but actually, as I started handling it and working with it, I was like, no, I think we're going to stay with this. We'll leave it as is. This works. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. The shape of the handle fits so perfectly in the palm. I mean, this thing, uh, whether it's in this sort of uh, uh, forward saber grip like this or whether you're like this. And, of course, it's great in reverse with that uh, place to put your thumb on the down slope, which I love. Uh but this is a very comfortable knife. I, I bet smaller it'd be comfortable too. But uh, something about the length and the broadness. This is a broader uh, affair than the than the Nomad. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, I actually widened the blade a little bit on the um, drawing that I sent to them. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, just as I was playing with it, I just it had one of those little uh, issues as I looked at it, no matter what angle I looked at it, something just didn't seem quite right in that drawing. So I just add a little width to it just to balance it for my personal uh, preference. And um, that's why it came out a little bit dimensionally uh, bigger, thicker or wider, I'm sorry, than you would see with the Nomad where it had a thinner profile uh, and with in relationship to the overall blade length and width. Uh, the original or uh, the Nomad itself did not have the opening hole, did it? No, it did not. And it had more of an upswept blade. So I kind of uh, truncated the blade a little bit. I, not truncated, that's the wrong word. Um, took some length out of the blade, kept that. So if you had extended that out and made it a little longer and then let that, the top of the spine, the curve follow the natural uh, its natural course to where the end of the blade would normally be, it would actually be more of a uh, upswept blade than it is. This one yeah. terminates and becomes more of a, it's it's above center line, but not by a ton. It's kind of like a Bowie. I mean, where the point is, yeah. it's 
the whole, the whole blade has the character of a of a Persian, uh, but uh, the way it's I guess slightly downward canted, or maybe it's this uh, spine slope. It puts the blade where we're we're used to. You know, a, a lot yeah. of the complaints about Persians is where the point is, and a lot of us in the modern times are not uh, slashing and and taking advantage of that curve as much as we're using the point to cut stuff open. Exactly. And 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 that upswept blade. Uh, yeah, upswept tip can sometimes be um, a turnoff for some people. The way recurves are, it's like it's not that hard to use. Just like a recurve, it's, it's really not that hard to sharpen. What are you using? Like a a medieval sharpening wheel? Like yeah, no <laughs> kidding. Like Ten inches broad. All you got to do is have something nice and thin. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like a triangle stone or a circular stone. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, but the, go. and with the uh, the Banjara, when you just held it up, I know I didn't really make the connection until you framed it the way you did. It basically looks like the uh, a Bowie blade, as you said, but you cut it off at the clip point. And yeah, you, yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, as soon as you put that up, I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize I did that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny because you did that. I, we're not done talking about this, but you did that with this, with the with the Razorback. You know, this is. Uh, I mean, you told me yourself that this was inspired not only by uh, uh, Middle Eastern blades, but also the Hell's Bells Bowie by Bill Bagwell, right? Mm -hmm. With that long clip, and yeah. the clip is starting right here. If this is a yeah. Bowie, this is where the clip starts. Uh, in the intro, for those of you who who aren't familiar, I was talking about Dirk's custom knives. This is 100% handmade, as is as are all the other uh, fixed blades I have by him, and he is a a, a very well respected uh, man at the grinder by his uh, by his peers. Um, Anyway, and by me, uh, but uh, I remember mentioning you to um, oh, who was it now? A guy from Ohio, awesome knife maker, and now he escapes me. And everyone know you would know him for sure. And he was like, he, he I said, who who's who do you admire? And he brought you up out of the blue. I had no idea you guys had. He wow. just knew you, and I will tell you afterward who he was. I'm spacing right now. Um, but he had a foul mouth. <laughs> I do remember that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> all right. So uh, S S ninety V on this S ninety V. Yes. You've been using a lot of S ninety V, and we'll talk about one of the prototypes uh, that you very generously gave to me. I think I was refusing to send it back or stalling, and you're like, just keep the damn thing. Uh, but you used S ninety V on that. You've been using it a lot recently. Um, what? When you do a knife like this with Artisan, do you get to pick the steel, A, and B, what are the benefits of S90V? So, yeah, we uh, most of the designers working with the uh, the companies do have a, the option of selecting the steel, um, unless the company has a very specific uh, goal in mind with the knife, where they may have it, you know, they see it as a budget-friendly knife, so they're not going to open up the, the premium steels. Um, so yeah, with artisan though, I usually have the option. They pretty much tell me, "Hey, how do you see this knife? Where do you want it to go? What do you want to do with it?" And uh, tell us the materials you want to use. So um, S90V, one of the advantages to it basically is the edge holding on it is is pretty darn good. I mean, there's very few steels that that exceed S90V when it comes to edge holding. It takes a great edge. Um, you can make it a toothy edge if you want. You can make it a polished edge. Um, and the the edge will last forever. It is a little bit of a challenge. It can be tricky to uh, to sharpen. But with all the sharpening aids these days, it, I mean, that's really not much of a hindrance now. Um, you know, back in the day, yeah, it was more of a pain in the butt to sharpen. But, I mean, you have Wicked Edge, uh, Edge Pro. You have the... Uh, work sharp. I mean, you name it, there's a multitude of ways to sharpen it. Yeah, so yeah, it's easy to do now. Uh, and, you know, for being real about it, uh, I, I'm betting a lot of the people who buy this knife uh, or a lot of S90V luxury knives, that's what they are, uh, are probably not um, bringing them to the construction site. I'm, I know that there are people who do take very, very fine knives and use the hell out of them. And I really admire that because uh, I would definitely take something less precious than this knife, say, if, if I were doing hard work with it. Uh, but that's kind of where the rubber meets the road, isn't it? Like, it seems like unless you're doing that kind of really hard daily work uh, with an S90V blade, you're probably not going to have to sharpen it. You might 
drop it every once in a while. Uh, if you're just using it kind of the way I do, and maybe more, maybe most <laughs> knife users use their knives more than I do, but yeah, uh, you know, because I don't really have too many uses for these things, uh, so they don't go dull fast. So, no. um, to me, I never ever come to the outer limits of a steel's performance, but there's still something nice about. Uh, knowing that it's uh, a a really high end steel coming from a reputable uh, source, uh, that's just super cool. Yes, know? yeah. I've, I've always so I'm not a steel snob. Um, if you told me I could only use 440C to make knives, I would wouldn't lose any sleep. Um, mm -hmm. It works great. It functions. It gets the job done for the vast majority of things you want a knife to do. You know. So, but at the same time. I like all the new steels. It's fun to explore. It's fun to see what they do. It's fun to have that option. Uh, you know, I played with S90 back a long time ago before it became popular. Uh, I liked it then and I tried to sell it. And at the time I was playing with it, nobody wanted to mess with S90. It was a pain <laughs> in the ass. It's too hard to sharpen. We don't want to mess with it. Right. Um, so it was okay, S35 or uh, S30. Um, and that was what pretty much what everybody wanted back in that time frame. Um, and fortunately we've come around and people now like uh, playing with the newer steels and they want to see it and they want to experiment with it. So it gives me that, uh, that option to experiment with new steels and see what they do and have some fun. So when you're making a knife like this, probably my favorite of yours, uh, the cave bear, um, are you using, uh, uh, this one is nitro V, but are you using those kind of super hard exotic steels in your in your handmade knives? Is that a super pain in the butt or what? Um, it can be. Uh, S90 is really not that bad. Um, just make sure you have a sharp belt. and It's, it's pretty good. Uh, you know, when you start doing stuff with like 10V, 15V, some of those things, then it becomes a little more challenging. Um, but the the high-end uh, stainless, the CPMs, uh, with the exception of maybe 110V, um, and even 110V isn't incredibly difficult to work with. Uh, so they're they're not that bad. Um, but when it comes to the handmaids, it depends on the function. Um, most of my self-defense oriented blades, I prefer to have a tougher steel. Um, so your S35s, your CPM 154, Magna Cut, uh, 3V, if, if people will accept that, um, you know, people are kind of weird on that one right now. Uh, why, why are they weird on that? Because it's more of an outdoor knife? or, or outdoor Yeah, they, they, don't, they view it as, well, it's going to rust or I have to take care of it or it's, it's an older steel. Um, that's actually the last time I was trying to convince somebody to use 3V. They were telling me what they were going to use it for. I said, 3V is the perfect candidate. And uh, I said, well, that's kind of an older steel. So, you know, it was like, okay. Uh, all right. Do you say yeah. so? I mean, if that's your argument, I'm not going to try and, you know, I can't argue that. It is, a, as as far as being out in the world, it has been around a little bit longer than uh, Magna Cut. So, yes. A little bit older, but a little bit that's, older, funny, yeah. man. that's funny because, uh, yeah, I find the 420 on my buck 110, 100% adequate for 95% of the things I do. Uh, yeah, it, is, it, it gets you. That got us uh, through a, a, how many decades before people started saying, "Hey, can we do better?" Um, yeah, and and how many decades of actual true hard work of actual working men taking their knives and and uh, using them hard, not guys like me who collect them and hoard them and put them in cabinets and lock them up, you know? Exactly. But and and it's guys like me, admittedly, who who make those distinctions. Huh, well, it's not in there. It's not. It's not a modern steel. So, and and I, and I too am not a steel snob. But I got to say, you know, if I'm paying a certain amount of money, I want to see a certain steel or above. Yeah, I, I definitely can appreciate that. Um, you know, I I have no issue with uh, with charging what you can charge because of your name. You know, what the reputation you've earned your skill level, the amount of uh, work went into the design, how popular a design might be, whatever, all those things come into it. Um, but when you're paying premium, 
I would rather, to your point, have someone say, here's a knife that's going to cost you $3,000 and it has magna cut as opposed to here's a knife that costs you $3,000 and it has AEBL. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> I'm remembering the knife maker. I was trying to remember who, who complimented you so highly. It was Sean Kendrick. Who, yes, uh, Sean. Man. Yes, I haven't He's, talked to him for a while. That That's really nice of him to say that. that I that. mean, his stuff is incredible. And and then, uh, you know, he kind of brought you up out of the middle of nowhere. And I was like, and this was kind of, well, before you and I knew each other, I knew of your work. And I was like, oh, really? Who is this guy? You know, and uh, uh Coming from him, I thought that was pretty cool because I, I in, at the time, held him in very high regard. Not that I don't now. I just haven't spoken with him in ages. So uh, that was Sean uh, Kendrick there. Um, oh, okay. So now uh, you sent me this prototype to check out. And this has a, a different steel, which uh, we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, this is S60V. But yeah. let's talk about this knife first. Um, okay, that is the Siafu. Siafu. Uh, what does that Siafu. mean? Siafu. So kind of like think of si, uh, the uh, Sifu, but add an A in there, Siafu. So, oh, Siafu. Okay. Siafu, yeah. It's, uh, I don't know the dialect specifically, but it's an African word, and it's, it's the name they use for uh, soldier, uh, army ant, soldier ant, or driver ant. Um, and it got that name because it was originally supposed to be the slightly bigger version of the fire ant. Uh, the fire ant started out as a knife a little bit smaller than that. And um, I showed it to uh, Mike Manrose and Daryl Ralph when they had HTM up and running. And uh, Mike said, Hey, we're going to, we're going to work with that. We're going to make a folder out of it. And um, he ended up making it bigger and the, the larger size fire ant stuck and the smaller fire ant kind of has faded into the background. Um, hmm. I brought the Siafu out of uh, obscurity, if you will. I made one or two in the past and uh, never really did anything with it. And it just seemed where things were currently with the smaller pocket-friendly fixed blades. I, I figured that's the perfect, perfect thing to bring back. And um, yeah, I, sh I showed that to... Uh, to concept and concept said, we'll take that. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> they're going to so be making this. They're going to be making that. Yeah. And oh. we're going to be doing a folder of it too, as well. Oh my God. That's so cool. I love concept. They're an awesome knife company. I love the stuff they produce and, um, and they do a, a wide variety of very interesting designs. They don't play it too safe. And I appreciate that. And I think the market does. That's why they've been so successful or one of the reasons why they've been uh, very successful um but it's cool to see them taking on a fixed blade i can't think of fix a fixed blade they've put out i'm sure they have they've done one or two um, okay yeah they're they've been a little hesitant um to do that mainly i think because they're still not what you would call them a, a big company mm -hmm. uh they're mm -hmm. still on the smaller size so they want to make sure everything that they do uh, they have a market for, and they, right. they know that the market, while it's a little more favorable for fixed blades currently, it's still heavily uh, skews towards the, um, the folder. So yeah, if you're going to take your chances, you're going to take your chances on something that, you know, will probably sell. Yeah. Uh, so this has the, uh, GL Hansen and son, um, G card, a handle here. Yes. Uh, I know I confirmed with you that this was GL Hansen, uh, and, um, I mean, not that it matters. It's spectacular. It's so beautiful, but he does such incredible work. I mean, yes, he does. He, he uh, really, he worked really hard on that. I've talked to him several times. Um, he, he's been wanting to actually try and make uh, handles, uh, aftermarket handles for different knives and um, with his own material, obviously. And he's been trying to learn, work with CNC, but he doesn't have the time to really delve into the, uh, the complete training he needs to get his uh, CNC up and running. Uh, so we've had that conversation and uh, he's told me how, what goes into making the G Carta and how he does it. And he does a really good job. He really yeah. does. He's, yeah. he's thought about it a lot. He is constantly rethinking what he needs to do with the bonding agent, with his epoxy, with his resin. 
Um, it's made to his specification and he's, he's always wanting to tweak it. Can I make it better? How can I do it better? And uh, he, he's come up with some phenomenal, phenomenal stuff. It's funny you should say that because this one seems like this seems it feels different from other G Carta I've felt. It seems harder, slicker. Like I know it's polished here, but um, oftentimes it felt raggy or, you know, felt like you could feel the the material itself. And I and that that also has a certain appeal. Um, but it, it, here's G Carta again on this amazing broadhead double-edged pocket uh, knife a another small fixed blade knife this one uh, was made uh, the production version of this custom one that you gave me was uh, made by kaiser or is made by kaiser and not in that blade shape but the same concept um <laughs> same <laughs> concept uh so i i have one thing that i would suggest for this knife well, what's uh, that? and everyone's gonna go ah oh. A lanyard hole. I know, I know. Or maybe it could be some sort of lanyard situation up here that doesn't jack up the handle. I know lanyard holes can really uh, mess up the handle for people. Like they don't like the way it looks. And I get that. And also, if you're a lanyard user and the hole is on the side and it's a small handle, which is the time I want a lanyard, it's more like a fob to remove it from its spot, less of a lanyard that's going around your wrist, obviously. But right. Uh, if it's on the side on a short handle, you feel it. You feel the cord coming out of the side and you feel it in your hand. That's why I was saying maybe some little, little one of those little posts you could put in the back there. And the only reason I'm saying that is because uh, um, I like, I like a little tiny, a uh, little fob thing. If I'm reaching into my pocket to retrieve a knife, it just kind of completes it a little bit, makes it easier to pull out. But that being said, you don't need one on this to make it a fully a full grip knife. Yeah, that's that's what I was working for with that. It is again the maximum handle um, in the smallest package possible, and that that's definitely where that one really fell into is uh, getting angles, width, um, and shape to really fill the hand, but still make it a small package. And your idea for the fob is is not uh, not alien on that because it actually started out with a uh, a lanyard hole, and it, that one may actually have one under the scales. Oh, oh, interesting. So I will you, not be taking it apart to look at it, but <laughs> well, you can. I mean, it, okay. it, they're just torques. There's nothing special yeah. to them. So yeah, yeah, you're right. I could just I could just pop this thing, pop yeah. this thing open. That's I don't right. know, man. Uh, oh, so I want to show, uh, for people who are curious, I have a fire ant, right? This is a fire ant, right? That is the fire ant. Yeah. Oh man. I, yeah. For a minute there, I, I started to doubt myself, but this is a triple edged fire ant. You got top edge, front edge and bottom edge. Uh, and so this is a full finger, um, a full four finger grip knife and it's got a straight handle and yet it carries so nicely appendix kind of fits in that line between your hip and your and your belly which yeah. i used to have <laughs> i don't have a line there anymore but anyway it fits in that area really nicely and you can you can draw it and use it obviously a self defense knife but obviously again something that can be used for utility this is a little bit more aggro than the fire ant we're talking or than the um um i'm sorry one more time siathu siathu uh here um but this is this would be great for all sorts of EDC stuff, but a Dirk Pinkerton design always seems to have uh, a mind, an eye on the self-defense. And this would also obviously be very wicked uh, in that case. You do a lot of Warncliffs. Um, what's what's with the Warncliffs? I've always just liked Warncliffs. Um, okay. it, they've always resonated with me as one of the most functional blade shapes uh, available. Um, it, you know, knives with uh, bellies have a, a purpose. They slice well. They cut well. They do certain things very well. They they give you multiple angles of cut for uh, for certain tasks. But at the same time, they can also limit um, other things. So you know, a, a Bowie blade is really cool to have. It gives you options, and you can stab with it if you want to. But at the same time 
you you lose a little bit in some of the slashing cuts, some of the draw cuts because of that curve. Um, and you have to work with the curve of the blade if you're going to make those cuts. Right. Um, and everything's a compromise. I mean, there is no perfect solution. But for me, working with smaller blades, the, the worn clip just is kind of the, the perfect thing. Um, so you get four inches and below, uh, four inches maybe pushing it, but I still like a big four inch worn clip blade. I, I just, I like the look of it. Yeah. But you, you, I mean, realistically, below four inches, a worn clip is to me the, the most adaptable universal blade you can have i mean it, it, it'll do pretty much everything you need it to do in that size range self-defense utility um you, you name it <laughs> yeah uh michael janich the guy who designed uh the yojimbo yojumbo uh series he he describes the warren cliff uh you know why he likes it in a tactical sense really well, you know, uh, you said you have to work with the curve when you have it. And I think what you mean is as you uh, as the knife is following the natural arc of your elbow, shoulder, whatever is launching that slash, uh, it is curving as the blade is curving against probably a curved surface. So yeah. uh, in order to, to make that work, you have to push, you have to push a little more, you know, you exactly. have to accommodate, but with this, uh, with a with a straight edge with a point down, uh, you know, at, at knuckle height, so to speak, uh, the the uh, as you're taking advantage of that uh, natural angle, that that point is always presenting itself deeper and deeper into the material you're cutting. Uh, exactly. Again, especially if it's curved, and most organic uh, targets are. Um, and as we've all noticed, it opens boxes great. It opens everything great, whether it's a box or something more <laughs> dynamic. Absolutely. It absolutely does. Um, and yeah, that's that's exactly the the idea of the point with the, the straight edge worn cliff. As you're making your cut, a slash and self-defense going through whatever soft material that's presented itself, most of the time that arc is going to advance to its apex and then it's going to withdraw and come back to you with a curved blade. That's what I mean by you have to work with it. If you're making that slash and that you know, that apex of that curve um, is, uh, is at the, the, the curve of the blade and that apex meet, you're losing your cutting ability. So you've yeah. given up length of that blade and the way, the only real way to make that work is to advance on that cut. So that means you have to be moving forward to have that blade feeding more material into the curve as you advance and bring the blade through. Uh, and with a worn cliff, and especially in a small package, you don't have to worry about that. Right. It and you could, through. yeah, you, you make your cut, the tip hits what it hits, and it's cutting all the way through. You don't have to worry about advancing. And it also works if you need, to, as you're withdrawing too, because as you're coming through, you have the straight edge coming around, not quite a true hawk build, but as you're rotating your wrist through, it wants to give you just a little bit of a hook coming through the material. So you're going to catch more material on the way out. You talk about that requirement for advancement or advancing to make a curved blade work as well. And, and that just made me think, boy, that, that really illustrates well why uh, cavalry swords are always curved and, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. scimitars and, and the, the Middle Eastern swords uh, are, are curved that way too. And a lot of that fighting happened on horseback. And so that advancing is happening at, you know, 35 miles an hour or whatever, exactly. uh, being on horseback and making a slash like that. Uh, you were also a very early adopter of the Pakal uh, style knife I have here. Uh, your custom inversion with the ring. So cool. This was originally a uh, reverse Tonto, uh, or we saw it originally as a reverse Tonto made by uh, Kaiser. I have one. I did not pull that one out. But uh, uh, you continued that uh, in your own private label uh, uh, knife here with the, with the, um, with the Pakal. I've been, you know, I follow Fieldworks, you know, Alex, mm -hmm. uh, yep. uh, he, he's been showing off one of your knives a lot recently, the past week or so he's been showing off different, uh, showing you with a, uh, uh, he showed that knife with a couple of Joe Watson knives and he called them like Epic giants or something like that. Um, and I'm trying to remember the name of that knife. Now it's yours. It's a Pical double edged, uh, oftentimes a, um, in a, in a Tonto shape. What is that called? 
the Smilodon. Smilodon, that's it. And yeah. he's got one that's got a really long and slender uh, double-edged uh, drop point blade. So it's, you know, it looks more like this in double edge than say um, uh, that, that Tonto shape. Yeah. It's just beautiful. So, so how, uh, how did you come up with the, uh, or how did you start making pick calls kind of so early? It didn't seem to be fashionable yet. It, it definitely wasn't fashionable, um, but it it, it was a, a where I was doing a lot of reading, um, where I was heavily into Bowie's at the time, and I was reading a lot of uh, Keating mm. um, stuff, and you know, looking at all the stuff he was doing with Bowie's and his fighting technique, and you know, it's like hey, it'd be cool to go to one of his camps one of these days, and you know, all that, and then I came across his uh, draw point. Uh, videos, which basically is taking your standard knife, not reverse grip knife, just a, a regular fixed blade straight knife. And the idea was basically just using it in a Pakal grip. Um, oh, yeah. He, there was no other name for it. He just called it draw point. Okay. And uh, so I'm sorry, I'm going to illustrate what you mean. So you mean just taking a, uh, a regular, let's pretend this is a fixed blade and using it like this? Yep. Okay. And that, that was it. And the idea was it was meant to be a quick, in close um, reactionary self defense technique where you draw. And he did a fun video of having balloons up on the wall. And he, you know, he would draw and somebody would call out a number like one and he'd pull and hit one. And they call a combination and boom, boom, boom. And illustrating that it was meant to be in close, as Pakal is, and very quick, very uh, quick reaction time with with a practice and that that intrigued me and the more i thought about it the more intuitive i thought the whole concept was of pakal reverse grip that type of uh knife fighting or knife defense self-defense application uh because it didn't require as soon as i saw i was like this doesn't require a ton of training this is all yeah. the caveman exactly that's what i was gonna say caveman yeah. uh adrenaline dump uh broad motions you know can exactly. you pull can you swing and pull you know and yep. with a with a giant bowie holy mackerel and if no one if if uh viewers or, or listeners are unaware pakal style uh is tip down edge in and james keating is a legendary bowie knife fighter you got to check him out he's, he's he's an interesting dude man he is um, he's very interesting he is yeah. indeed he's a he's a pretty cool cat um he's, yeah he does things his own way and he, he really doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I, I want to talk about yet another, uh, Warren, uh, Warren cliff and yet another prototype. And, uh, people are, have seen this a lot cause I carry it a lot and I, it, it goes into a lot of my pocket checks. This is your standoff model. Um, and this is a prototype, which you gave me and I'm, I'm so grateful for it. As a matter of fact, you can see right here, uh, this morning, I cut a whole bunch of zip ties because we still had our Halloween stuff up. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> it's time to take these down. And and you were talking about uh, certain things that Warren Cliffs can do uh, better than any other blade. And this is a true Warren Cliff, meaning it's uh, coming from the Ricasso to the point. It's a continuous curve yeah. uh, as opposed to a, a uh, one with a with an angle. And then you get into is this a. Warren Cliff or a ver reverse Tonto or a modified sheep's foot. It just muddies yeah. the water, but this is no doubt a Warren Cliff all day long. And exactly. what this is great at, uh, among other things, this is an S 90 V blade was slipping under the, um, zip ties and just twisting. Yep. And it was this very fine, um, shape at the tip that allowed me to sneak in there. And, and of course it's razor sharp and S 90 V. So it, it, it went right through it. And didn't need to be resharpened afterwards. <laughs> Good. So, so tell me all about this knife. I, I, I feel like this is a perfect folder. Uh, the, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know, like, you want to um, sharpen up the um, the edge of the of the fuller so that you reverse flick it easier. You can still reverse flick this one, but, um, but other than that, this is a per a perfect knife as far as I'm concerned. Tell me about the, um the inspiration of it and, and how you came up with the design. 
So that, in all honesty, is is an evolution of the Main Street. How? <laughs> oh, I wish I pulled out my Main Street to show it. Uh, how, uh, interesting. This is an evolution of the Main Street. It is. Because uh, the handle doesn't remind me of the Main Street, nor does the blade. How, yeah. how did, tell me tell me about this evolution. When, when you when you compare it, you, you'll see it. Um, just there's some subtle changes I made. The Main Street was uh, very, I, I will call it um, blocky in design. Mm-hmm. purposefully with a little bit of a curve on the spine of the the blade just a subtle curve but when you put the the clipped tanto reverse tanto on it and then you put the thumb ramp you kind of lose that curve uh because it changes that perspective yes i see what you're saying yeah so basically uh what i did was i i, I love the main street um and i'm hoping that goes on forever because i it, it I just it's it is an old an older concept I've had in my mind uh, as far as a, a folder design that I never really did anything with until recently. So I'm very, very happy that concept has it. They're running with it and they seem to be thrilled to continue to put out different versions of it. Yeah. So I don't want that to go anywhere. But as I was thinking about what it is and where it came from, I started thinking, OK, I'm happy with it. But how can I make it better? Can I make it better? What do I want it to do? And then I started thinking through, okay, this is what I like about it. What do I see in other folders that I like? How can I bring things that work somewhere else and incorporate it into that? And what I basically came up with was uh, Michael Janik, um, Yojimbo. And in all honesty, I will say without a without a doubt in my mind, he designed with the Yojimbo the perfect self-defense knife, hands down. It, it may not look pretty stylish, but it is exceedingly functional. Uh, he has thought through a multitude of things. He's incorporated them exceptionally well. You can't really, in my opinion, improve upon it. Um, you can do something that's your own, that you like, that's a little bit more you, but every time I pick one of those up and I just look at it and I hold it up, like he has completely thought this through. I, you know, I can't think of a weakness in that knife. So I can't copy it and I'm not going to try and copy it, but I am going to take my design language and I'm going to think through, okay, this is the main street is my baby and it's something I really like. What did he do that I can, I can borrow from and put in there and make it mine and make some of what he did in that Yojimbo so well and make the main street better. And some of the curve in the handle is, is that, and you'll see that curve is, is reminiscent also of the, uh, the inversion. It's a very similar approach. Um, so I said that it needs that and it needs the, uh, the ability to get the thumb out on the, the blade, but not on a ramp. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Got to do away with the ramp because mm-hmm. uh, that gives you more control over a broader range of applications where a thumb ramp is can be very limiting. Um, and the cur- the uh, the true Warncliffe nature of the blade, that actually came from the feedback I received on a lot of the inversions where they, they're like, hey, the, the Tonto point is really cool and you can change the angle a little bit, but if you round that off, that thing is going to be so much better. And that's where I was like, okay, we're going to round it off and that's what we're going to do. And this is where we're going to end up. And once I got that in my hands, I'm like, this is it. This is, I'm happy. Um, it is my version of a self-defense horn flip folder. Man. I, I mean, yes. 100 percent. this is a would make a great self-defense folder um and and yet like again you've made a really awesome just everyday carry knife and and i could be in my own echo chamber here but i think that to the average person out there the warncliffe blade is less threatening looking 
than say something upswept even something like this looks scarier somehow yeah i would imagine to the average person uh, i don't i'm not sure about that but uh i this this looks more maybe like utility oh well officer i use this to open boxes uh, oh okay yeah. uh but with the length like this is a what 3.8 inch it's almost four yeah. inches yeah, yeah it's right in that range and but <laughs> but again like for those who don't like the bigger knives it doesn't really it measures that way but it doesn't feel that way necessarily it certainly doesn't carry like a, a large knife it sort of melts in your pocket especially with these very broad chamfers which are totally dug uh, i mean sorry, it's totally dirk pinkerton uh these long these wide chamfers almost a third of the width and then a third of the width and a third of the width make it feel round without making it round if it's round it can do this in your hand you know but you've got these flat surfaces um geez where am i going i'm just <laughs> going off I, uh i can't remember what i was going with that but um well i'm i'm, I'm on board with what you're doing so carry on <laughs> uh, i will keep that oh oh and here's another thing you know uh i'm sure people are totally sick of hearing of this because i whine about it my my thumb i cut it doing something stupid uh, nicked a nerve or whatever and uh, don't have the same feeling in my thumb i'm told you told me actually it'll come back after a while hopefully as it did with yours um but it it's changed how thumb studs feel to me it, it's changed how locking a knife now yeah. unlocking a knife i'm using my forefinger because <laughs> i can't gauge the pressure and sometimes it hurts it's weird so now i'm just closing it with the forefinger um so this does have good access to the lock bar and that's evidenced by the by the forefinger use uh but this one also uh uh is flipper only un until that uh un you know it's flipper and and fuller deployed so this was another reason why i've been carrying it a lot um cuz it's easy for me to open it's so awesome to use it's super sharp uh, okay so tell us I, i've been waxing uh, poetic about this i love it when when is, is it going to be released and what kind of changes are are you thinking about i know you've told me some other things you were kind of uh, bandying about in your own mind but what are you thinking about this in terms of release and possible changes so um release if everything goes the way i want it to go as far as um getting the uh the in financing behind it. Um, we're looking at 25 sometime next year. I'm hoping mid year. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll see, uh, the changes, not many, um, uh, because the, I'm really, really happy with the design. So it's some very subtle stuff. Uh, the fuller, I want to do a flat bottom fuller square shoulder for, you know, the opening aspect of it. Yeah. And then the, uh, another subtle change would be in the jimping on the flipper. That's a little bit, the, the jimping is a little oversized. I, I made it a little <laughs> bit too funny. big. So I'm going to make the, the jimping just a little finer. So it's, it's a little less aggressive. Um, I'm looking at uh, some type of texturing on the handle, just a subtle texturing to give it just a little bit of grip. And I've pl been playing around with ideas on that. Something similar to the micro milling on the clip here, or yeah. something more like this with more relief. A little more subtle, a little more like the micro milling, because um, I don't think even with it being smooth, I've been playing with it, mine in and out of the pocket, sweaty hands, dry hands, and it it actually uh, because of the size and the shape, it doesn't really need a ton of of texturing to to maintain grip. Um, it, it's just a question of do I want to worry about you know uh, getting your hands wet in whatever you get your hands wet in um yeah. and that's i haven't decided if i want to go down that rabbit hole or not and, and these little things are kind of what are uh slowing the process down kind of what the same thing with the inversion um i've done three knives that i have overthought literally uh, tried to think of every possible scenario um, for where I was in that time frame of my design work. Uh, the Nomad was the first one. My inversion is the second one. And the standoff is the third one. I'm constantly looking at it, thinking about it. Uh, okay, I'm going to do this. And I think about it. No, I'm not going to do that. No, we're going to do this. We're going to move this over here. Uh, so that's kind of the where I'm at. I'm still throwing ideas around. Um, 
the other thing that I'm looking at doing, and I think I mentioned it to you, was the uh, I want to do an ambidextrous clip. Um, yeah. The current clip has a slight curve to it, mm -hmm. which gives it a little flow and, and makes it fit the design better. But it doesn't work too well as being ambidextrous. So I'm looking at doing a straight clip. And I don't find it offensive, but it, at the same time, it doesn't look as good. Yeah, you were you were talking to me about um, how would it look with the uh, Main Street clip on it, which is a is still a sculpted clip, but it's straight. Yeah, and it it actually you know you you asked me to swap it out. I did. It looked fine. It looked good because the whole damn knife looks good. But uh, you know, I if you do change it to that, I'll be psyched that I have this one just because it it will be different <laughs> <laughs> from everyone else's. Um, but uh, what was I going to ask you? Oh, about the about uh, doing the OEM process, and just to remind people or let people know that this falls into a, a a third category. You make custom handmade knives. You do designs that are released by companies like Concept and Kaiser, etc. But then you do these designs where you design them, you labor over them, like we're talking about right now, and then you have an OEM make them after a pre order to fund the manufacturer. Yeah. Um, do you tell people who your OEM is or is that something that just. Yeah, I, I do. I, 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 yeah. If you ask, I'll tell concepts making this one. Um, ah. It's yeah, it's not a secret. Um, okay. I have been in contact with a couple of different companies and they do request anonymity. Um, mm -hmm. Interesting. And uh, so if I come out with something and I don't put a name on it, you'll know that it's not concept or it's not Kaiser. What? Why? Why? I would think that the knife maker would be more interested in that anonymity than than the company. Why? Why would they do that? Do you think? I do not know. Um, I think it could potentially be that they don't want to have their name necessarily tied to any one person. So I think it could be they have their their brand that they do, and they don't want anybody to come in and it's like, oh, they're doing them too, and and uh. they must design for them. I think they're trying to keep things nice and tidy. This is yeah. us, and we'll do stuff for you. You just don't tell people who yeah. who made it. Yeah, I know of another. Uh, oh, I know of a big. Well, Jack Wolf knives. I've mentioned it many times. Uh, he he doesn't. He can't say who the OEM is, and that's the first time I heard of that. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And of course, so that makes speculation fly. I bet this this feels like a Riyadh or this. You know, like what do you know about that? You don't know. <laughs> um, uh, so that that's cool. So uh, just so people know that this this will be a pre order thing. This is not going to be on KnifeCenter dot com. This will be something that you well. How how do people get uh uh how how do people get this? How do they keep up with you? How do they uh, sign up for this? So once uh, once that's ready to roll, I'll do a pre order and I'll post it on uh, Instagram. Uh, that's my primary social media platform, um, mainly because I'm too lazy to manage other platforms. It's just easy to do Pro one. Probably too busy, but go ahead. <laughs> I'm just too feeble minded. I can't handle that much work. Yeah, I'm very, very single task oriented. You give me more than two things at once and I'm, I blow up. My brain falls apart. I hear you, brother. Um, so yeah, I just do Instagram and um, I'll post it there, make the announcement. And uh, once I get to a certain level on the pre-orders, then I start the process and manufacturing is usually pretty quick. Um, the last time I had a delay with uh, with concept on the uh, inversion, and that was actually just my fault for timing it when it hit during one of the Chinese holidays. Oh, uh, so those things are, I always thought we had a lot of holidays. I didn't realize how many holidays in China. <laughs> I think we should start incorporating them into our, no, no, we shouldn't. All right. Uh, <laughs> before I let you go, because we're about to wrap here, I do want to bring up the night horse. I showed this off before. For a quick second, uh, a modern interpretation. I, I was holding it like this. That's why I'm showing it when you were talking about James Keating. Uh, this is your modern interpretation of the Navaja, the Spanish uh, folding fighting knife that that uh, emerged after Spaniards could no longer carry swords around town to settle their their beefs. Uh, it's one of my favorite knives from history, and you did such a bang up job on this. It's so cool. It's so modern. Uh, nice. But it, it, it definitely, you know, that is a Spanish clip point all day long, even though it looks kind of modern and everything else about this. But I know that this was an exclusive knife to um, uh, uh, 
um, Smoky Mountain Knife Works. This, this in uh, S35VN in titanium, I think it is S35. And yeah. then one that, that's in uh, 14C28 N and G10 that literally you could sing a song and they would send it to you. It was unbelievable yeah. how, uh, how that thing was priced and such a great knife. The other one, I gave it to my brother and I want it back, <laughs> but, uh, is it, what's the future of the night horse? Is this something that people can still get? Uh, will this live on? It's officially it's in limbo, uh, mainly because Smoky Mountain isn't sure when they are going to start uh, another run. They have okay. told me they want to do it again, but they don't know when. Uh, so what I tell everybody is contact Smoky Mountain and tell them you want the night horse. Um, the next run will be with a flipper. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, and that's that was by uh, by popular demand. Uh, they they didn't like the thumb stud, and in all honesty, it looks to me it looks cool, but functionally, I agree with them. I think I would second run. Yeah, we'll do away with the thumb stud. I, I wouldn't mind the flipper uh, for especially for a finger guard. I mean, like the thumb stud has always worked fine for me. Um, but a finger, a little extra finger guard on that big knife, you know, for when you're dueling or something like that yeah, exactly. really comes in handy. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, you know, get a hold of uh, Smoky Mountain, let them know you want to see the night horse again. Uh, the more they hear about it, the uh, quicker it comes to, to light. All right, uh, Dirk, before I let you go, which I'm about to about to do, but everybody listen to those words. Uh, if you like the Spanish Navaja and you want a super cool modern version of it, um, talk to smoky mountain knife works tell them you want it and they'll bring it back are the g10 ones gone too yeah the g10 they flew off the shelves oh. almost immediately uh there's still a few of the the titanium left and when we talked about it they want to stay with the g10 uh hmm. the titanium didn't move quite as fast as they wanted to for their uh sales models so Roger. it'll just be g10 next time through all right, so I don't have to. I don't have to get it back from my brother. I'll just buy it next time, and I will give Smoky Mountain Knife Works a uh, an email uh, just to let them know because I want to see it with a with a flipper. <laughs> it's uh, gonna look good. Yeah. Uh, well, I've I've uh, gotten a lot out of you about your prototypes and and everything, but I got to ask you uh, before I let you go again. Uh, what's what's in the offing in terms of cool cultural mashups? For knives that you're thinking about maybe it's not uh, fully fleshed out but what are the knives from history and other cultures you're looking at right now uh to put up um i'm looking at uh i want to play with a uh, chris um i want to do my interpretation of a chris oh. um that's always something i've wanted to play with i've done i did one in the past uh, i have no idea where it went i sold it and i have not seen it anywhere it hasn't popped up online anywhere uh, but I want to do that again, and um, I want to play with it some more. I, I like some of the variations that uh, the Chris has, and I think that's that'll be a lot of fun, especially to grind. I, I can get lost in that one easy. Um, oh, I'll say. And then the uh, uh, it's oh the Kanjarli. Um, basically, it's a variation on the Kanjar. Oh, okay. um, it's almost kind of like a Chris, uh, kind of like a. a Small Yadagon. Uh, it's got a oh uh, uh, Turner CNC. They're doing the yes, the gin. The gin. I happen to have yeah. one right here on loan. I have to send this along. But this. So that that swoop that that recurved drop is is very reminiscent of a Kunjarli. Um, the Kunjarli is a little more has a little more of an extreme turn to the blade, but yeah, it's very very close to that. Cool. Oh my God. I love that. I love the, uh, the Vaquero, you know, by cold steel that was uh Yadagan influenced, yeah. uh, as is this gin, which is gorgeous. My God, he makes cool stuff. Uh, this yes. Turner, this Turner fella, I'm this trying to get him on the show too. Um, well, I can't wait to see your, uh, uh, Conjarling, 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 Conjarling. Yeah. Uh, we, we will keep our eyes peeled. And uh, uh, for those of you listening, uh, if you're a patron, we are going to continue this conversation for a few more minutes elsewhere. Uh, well, you can you can find that on our Patreon page. Uh, and I'm going to ask you a couple of other questions. But Dirk, thank you so much for joining me. I feel like this time just flew. And uh, man, I love your work. And I always love, 
really like talking to you. So thanks, uh, thanks for it. joining me again, man. I had a blast. I love doing this. Cool. Well, we'll have you back again. Just to make more cool knives. All righty, sir. Take care. Take care. Adventure Delivered, your monthly subscription for hand-picked outdoor, survival, EDC, and other cool gear from our expert team of outdoor professionals. TheKnifeJunkie.com slash BattleBox. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Dirk Pinkerton. You know, he he's a celebrity to me. Uh, you know, most people like, uh, you know, uh, Beyonce and folks like that. Uh, to me, uh, the people who make the kind of art I love uh, are guys like Dirk. So thank you, Dirk, for coming on. And thank you for, like, continuing to investigate uh, this stuff and get deeper and deeper and create cooler and cooler knives. It's so appreciated. All right. Uh, and your viewership is appreciated. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, be sure to join us on uh, Wednesday for the Midweek Supplemental and Thursday for Thursday Night Knives. For Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast